This video was made using insights from vidIQ. Stick around after the video to find out how we used vidIQ as our secret YouTube weapon while making it. It's currently Russia's best tank, but the T-90 has proven itself to be hot garbage. When the war in Ukraine kicked off, we saw a great deal of Russian T-72s hit the battlefield, but strangely its modern T-90s were initially rarely seen. Leaving the world to wonder, if the T-90 is Russia's best tank, why are they leading the charge in an older model? Turns out it's because the T-90 isn't that great. But it's very important for Russian arm exports, with many countries around the world operating variants of the T-90. If one of your biggest breadwinners suddenly shows it can't stand up to even semi-modern threats, countries currently operating those vehicles are going to start having second thoughts about future purchases. This has been a recurring problem for the Russian armed forces as their equipment fails to operate as advertised. Already countries such as India, typically big customers of the Russian defense industry, are looking elsewhere for future purchases. The lackluster performance of the T-90 in Ukraine is only making this worse as the tank is proving that developing it in the first place was a huge mistake. The T-90's fundamental weaknesses were baked in from the start. The tank began as a Soviet program designed to produce a replacement for the Soviet Union's entire tank fleet. By the late 1980s, the British were already fielding the mighty Challenger, the Germans already had the Leopard II, and the Americans had left decades of lackluster tanks behind to field the formidable Abrams. The Soviet Union was in danger, and it needed a tank to answer to this new threat. The T-90 was not it. Rather than take a cue from the West, which began redesigning their main battle tanks from the ground up, the T-90 shared the same fundamental design of the T-72. This made it less of a brand new tank and more of an extensive upgrade, and left the Soviets with a tank built around the design philosophies of the early to mid Cold War. The West, meanwhile, had radically changed their designs to meet the current and future threats. So right out of the gate, the T-90 was already several steps behind. But the Soviets were simply being Soviet about things. Rather than invest in a robust, capable, and modern tank, they went with the old Stalin adage of quantity is a quality all its own. This might have been true back during Stalin's time at the wheel, but in the age of attack helicopters, smart munitions, and computerized warfare, quality suddenly means a hell of a lot. The T-90 was designed to be cost-effective, in other words, cheap, which would allow the Soviets to field it in huge numbers. Still operating under the flood doctrine of World War II, where Soviet tanks basically overwhelmed their superior German counterparts with sheer numbers, the T-90 was a perfect vehicle for a type of warfighting that was obsolete. The one good thing about building a cheap tank is it's very easy to maintain, and this was of special significance to the Soviet Army, equipped with three different models of tanks. T-64s, T-72s, and T-80s all shared many similarities, but required many different components, making them a logistical nightmare to operate in a high-loss environment like a modern war. For a military that's already terrible at the job of logistics, the T-90 promised to relieve the burden of overwhelmed Soviet upkeep personnel. Inevitably, the Soviet Union fell to pieces, and the tank manufacturing, which had already slowed to a crawl, all but stopped. The Malyshev factory was now located in independent Ukraine. The Linen Kirov manufacturing plant had ceased building tanks in 1990, and only two major plants remained open for business. Budgetary woes also resulted in the severe slowdown of production. When the first Chechen war popped off, Russia sent in the tanks. Notably, though, its modern T-90s were missing from the fight. Instead, T-72s and T-80s led the charge, only to be absolutely savaged by rebel forces with a few tanks of their own. Granted, Russia's major tank losses were mostly due to their very poor doctrine and use of unsupported tanks in urban combat, but the fact is that these tanks were clearly not survivable in a modern threat environment and it was not missed on the world. Cleverly though, Russia saved the T-90 from having a terrible reputation by simply keeping it out of the fight. According to the Russians, the T-90 was one of the best in the world, if not the best, and it made no sense to use it against an enemy not fielding significant armored forces of their own. The world bought the hype which was good news for Russia's finances as the T-90 continued to sell abroad. However, the fact that the T-90 and T-72 were so similar should have been a warning bell for Russia's customers, as the T-72 performed exceptionally poorly in Chechnya. In 1996, Colonel General Alexander Galkin, chief of the main armor directorate of the Russian Ministry of Defense, stated that Russia would no longer produce the T-80 and instead focus on building the T-90. Just a few months later, however, he quickly reversed his position without explicitly stating why, but publicly advocated that the T-80 was after all superior. That's pretty much the opposite of what you would want to hear after investing hundreds of millions of rubles into a new tank. Good job developing this brand new vehicle, but by the way, this older one is actually better. 
The T90 did take some cues from the T80 though, including it into its design. Chiefly, this was including the Irtysh fire control system and an upgraded engine capable of 840 horsepower. That's impressive, until you consider at the same time American Abrams tanks were not just better protected, but had engines delivering well over 1,000 horsepower. Today the Abrams publicly tops out at 1,500 horsepower, while the T90's engines top out at just under 1,300. Weighing in at about 48 tons, this is pretty good horsepower for a tank its size. However, when you consider the Abrams clocks in at 1,500 horsepower and weighs over 70 tons, and that most of that weight is in its armor package, well, we know which tank we'd prefer to be in. The T90 eventually ran into some issues in the export market and this started to affect its sales. An Indian order for T90s went sideways when the Russians used older turrets mounted to new hulls. The older turrets were not as well protected as the new turrets, but Russia decided to use them in order to exhaust their supply of the pre-built turrets. While under test, the tank's fire control system and thermal imaging site completely failed in the heat of the Indian summer. Overheating was such an issue that a Russian manufacturer offered to build special air conditioning units for the tanks, which unsurprisingly also failed, leading to one tank driver fainting from heat stroke. The Indian Ministry of Defense was forced to source a solution from the global market. Nations facing the prospect of a major war against a peer adversary such as India have begun to rethink their ongoing relationship with Russian tank manufacturers. Others, though, more interested in numbers than quality still find the T-90 a solid buy. But if you're concerned about modern threats, the fact that the T-90 weighs in 20 tons under such tanks as the Abrams, the Challenger 2, and the Leopard 2 gives serious cause for concern. The Abrams has famously ballooned in weight to the point that its ability to cross many bridges is in serious question, but it's also extremely survivable. In a world where the first shot typically decides the victor, the ability to survive a first and even second shot is a significant quality, and the T90 is not even guaranteed to achieve the first shot capabilities because, no surprise, its electronics are lackluster compared to Western tanks. The biggest flaw with the T90 is that unlike a tank like the Abrams, which has the capability to undergo modular upgrades, the T90 is simply a Frankensteinian mix of a T80 and a T72 with little room for upgrades. This is best exemplified by the fact that its autoloader can't fire Russia's newer and larger anti-tank kinetic projectiles, which were designed to be fired by the T-14 Armada. These new projectiles are a significant threat to modern armor, which is why it's a good thing the T-90 can't fire them. In Chechnya, Russian armored vehicles, both tanks and BMTs, were savaged by fighters firing anti-tank weapons from rooftops and third-story windows. Unable to elevate their guns to aim that high, the vehicles had no way of protecting themselves. Good thing the T-90 didn't go to Chechnya, because its main gun elevation is also terrible. This doesn't help it in tank-on-tank -tank engagements either. The T-90 can elevate and depress its gun in a range of positive 14 to negative 6 degrees. The Abrams, meanwhile, has a range of positive 20 to negative 9 degrees. This means that an Abrams tank can compensate for distance better than a T-90, and simply raise its cannon higher to shoot further, helping achieve that critical first shot kill. Because the T-90 is basically an upgraded T-72, its armor is fundamentally weaker than modern tank armor. The addition of explosive reactive panels was meant to help it defeat the threat of anti-tank missiles, and originally the tank had two laser dazzlers to interfere with the missile's guidance system. Once upon a time, these might have worked on some guidance systems, but modern anti-tank weapons as proven in Ukraine simply shrug them off. It also doesn't help that most of the ERA bricks fitted on these tanks are actually just egg crates because your commander sold off the ERA to make some extra cash on the side. But the T-90 wasn't faring well against older weapons either. In 2015, Russia entered the Syrian conflict and sent its T-90s. They were greeted by rebels armed with American TOW 2A missiles. The results, well, they speak for themselves. As the T-90 can't engage enemy tanks at the ranges that they're able to bring the pain, it needs to get in closer in order to threaten them. This makes the armor's vulnerability even more of a survivability problem. For a while, the T-90 lacked a dedicated thermal sight for the commander. Modern T-90s have rectified this mistake, though Ukraine was surprised to discover that captured and destroyed T-90s were equipped with French-built sights rather than Russian ones. As Russia now has been cut off from advanced electronics by the West, T-90s rolling off the assembly line and entering the fray are going to be equipped with Russian sights. And there is strong evidence to show that these are not nearly as capable 
India is also deeply unsatisfied with the quality of the sights included in their recently purchased T90s and once more is on the international market looking for new sights to install themselves. One really has to question why India continues to buy Russian equipment. The replacement of the Contact 5 explosive reactive armor with relict armor on upgraded T90s is also an improvement. This combined with a new armor layered under it gives enhanced survivability against heat rounds. However, ERA is completely useless against modern kinetic energy penetrators. They are simply too dense and move too fast for ERA to do much but slightly change their trajectory when it's already too late. The constant flow of limited upgrades is indicative of the T90's biggest problem. It's an old tank design that Russia is struggling to keep relevant. Faced with major budgetary problems, Russia can't afford to actually field a new main battle tank such as the T-14 Armada, which is why only just over a dozen have actually been built. Instead, it's forced to keep trying to make the T-90 relevant against modern threats. But the original design was already approaching obsolescence when it was first fielded. As near-modern tanks enter Ukraine with late-model Leopard 2s and possibly some American Abrams, the T-90 is quickly going to become endangered prey. What the tank desperately needs right now is the ability to fire Russia's new 1-meter-long kinetic energy projectile to at least try to keep Western tanks at arm's length. But since its autoloader can't fit it, the T-90 remains an old tank forced to use old rounds against an increasingly modern arsenal being fielded by Ukraine. And of course, there's still the problem of Russia storing its ammo inside the tank compartment, turning its crew into astronauts the moment they take a direct hit. Ever wondered how we decide what to make videos about? We're going to let you in on a little secret. It's vidIQ. It lets us see exactly how many searches per month a certain keyword gets. More searches means more potential viewers, but of course there's more to it than that. vidIQ also shows you the competition for that keyword. The less competition there is, the more likely that your video will stand out, which means more views for your video. I know it sounds too easy, but it really is. You don't need to have a genius IQ, you need to have vidIQ. But try it for yourself. Get a 30-day trial for only a dollar by going to vidIQ.com slash the info show. Now go check out why Putin is scared to deploy the T-14 into Ukraine or click this other video instead.